गुड इवनिंग सर ओके गुड इवनिंग सो ऑटोमा इंजिन एंड कंपोनेंट्स मॉड्यूल सो वी आर गोइंग टू go to the automotive gearboxes and uh, session number 2 actually this is not session number 1 it should be session number 2 so today um, okay uh so we had already one session related to this uh, uh during that session we uh, just went through the gearbox types removing the gearbox from the vehicle and uh, dismantling of the gearbox so we up to there we have actually gone through so uh, today we will be actually going through the cleaning and inspection process and assembling the gearbox so yeah even though this is the main uh, idea or main sections we will be discussing up for in this since we are doing it as a Online sessions until we go back to the university. Uh, the, um, mostly, we'll be doing the discussion how the parts work and what sort of uh, operation actually happens inside. So that's all we'll be discussing today uh, as well. So, and uh, there's one part I'm actually going to skip. Uh, that is uh, this section over here, which is uh, cleaning section. So there's not much of uh, information to be discussed regarding the. Uh, cleaning process it's very much similar to the cleaning of usual engines component so there's no not much of a difference here so i will be just skipping this because we already discussed about this uh, that section over in the automobile engines section and um, uh, yeah so since uh, government is planning to open the country i think monday so with that i guess with the vaccine it seems like the vaccination process is also going on if everything goes well hopefully we will be actually able to uh go back to the university and start the practicals okay uh yeah about the um, uh, before i go ahead with everything i just need to inform uh a uh, few be the few things actually so uh one of the things uh, one of the thing i one of the main things i want to discuss is so uh, uh please don't send the emails uh with the assignments so i can't actually take any assignments uh, if you send me emails it's not possible to collect them as emails because it's uh, if you have assignments you always have to submit it through lms now there's no way i'm going to take any uh, email assignments uh, if you have lms issues just talk to the university lms uh, whoever is in charge and make sure you fix it uh i can't accept them as emails it's really difficult to process them if you send them as emails and you you don't send all the details and it's become very hard for me at the end when i'm actually uh preparing the exam papers and i don't have to find me get lost because but they even without your uh um even without your emails or assignment emails i usually get around 30 emails so with that 30 once i came up with your emails there's a big possibility i may actually miss one few of your emails so there because of that i actually can't take that risk so you always have to submit to lms there's no way other way i'm actually going to uh, take the email and uh, make sure you actually check the lms uh, regularly because there will be some information posted for example this uh, presentation is actually posted in the lms and uh, uh is madhushan here no okay uh, came in this here right came in the what happened today morning monday morning or evening that um, sarah and sales module Was it fixed? The problem was it fixed or or did it continue? Yeah, one more thing uh, before we go ahead. Uh, so some students actually have some difficulty in logging into uh, or coming into the lectures because of. 
I don't know some issue internet issues, power cut this and that. Uh, but unfortunately, only uh, allowance given to us. So the, because of the new regulations, we are on, we can only allow you to uh, sit the exam after to eighty percent is. Uh, there's no uh, less attendance than eighty percent. Eighty percent is needed, even though online or offline, eighty percent is needed. So in uh, with that, if you have uh, any difficulties, uh, if you have any problems when you are not attending or something, if you have anything like that, make sure you inform it uh, as soon as possible. So uh, when you inform also, as you know, you have to provide like uh, some uh, proof that you actually had this problem. So I don't know how you're going to get that, but uh, that's the regulation say. So what I did was, if you had any problems during your class, and if you were unable to attend at least eighty percent of the class, right? At least eighty percent of the class, uh, I actually uh, prepared a certain uh, something like a uh, something like a gateway that you can actually go and uh, put your name and uh, provide all of your attendance records or. Uh, the proofs you can actually upload your proofs and show that uh, you were unable to attend this class because of this reason so at the end i don't have to actually worry and correcting so email you just inform this is the, uh, this is the problem that's why you didn't attend but uh, it's uh, and uh, for proof for this particular reason is attached here right so you can do like that uh, that's actually available in your the link for that, the link uh, needed for that is actually added to your uh, uh, LMS account. Still, it's not active after today class only it will be active. So the link will be added. Uh, so there's another folder, right? Another topic actually included as a, uh, called as uh, named actually actually name as course administration. So course administration, uh, it will be added to every course that I'm actually taking. So that uh, will give you your results, anything related to your results and uh, your attendance problem. So you can actually, there's a link there. So you can actually uh, complain about these sort of things, right? In addition to that, if you need to know something, you can actually have like there's a link. So you can feel that uh, if you have any questions or any complaints or something if you want to learn something additionally you can fill that and uh, the, i can actually give answers you in the class probably i will take an extra class for that uh, but i will be able to do it <laughs> anyway so coming back to the class uh, in addition to that i actually added a book i uh, no i still upload it i still i only have it so i actually go i will be uploading a book in so this is the book, right? So this is the book. So make sure you all, you guys, all of you guys actually download this book. Uh, it's actually very useful, right? This is very useful uh, to understand this, uh, everything related to automobile. So this module most like 90% of the things available in module is also available in this book also and uh, it actually have good illustrations and good instructions so you can actually follow them very well even the even up to this uh, safety regulations uh, so what sort of equipment shop shape you see so all of these things are included so make sure you download this book and make sure you may use this book. Uh, it will not only be useful for us, uh, I mean, uh, for this module, it will be useful for automotive electricals, uh, electronic modules, and uh, all the rest of the modules that we'll be learning later on. Okay. Coming back to the class. Yeah, so today we will be discussing that last two topics and uh, finish it off as social as always at least first so first part is actually inspecting a gearbox yes uh, inspecting a gearbox since i actually gave you some links uh, from uh, youtube 
about assembling and disassembling of the manual gearbox. So I'm not actually going to go through that again. And it does not make any sense for me to explain it again. It's already very well explained. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically uh, uh, every component of the manual gearbox has to be examined very well. And uh, speaking of components, few uh, has to be very well actually uh, examined. One of the main uh, components need to be examined is uh, one actually we called as uh, stringer machine. The one we call as stringer machine. I'm not actually going to explain to you what is a stringer machine and because you should be known what is a stringer machine. So this is actually a string commission unit. Uh, you learn what is a string commission unit in your last semester, right? You learn it uh, during your last semester. Could someone tell me what is the purpose of uh, string commission is? Yeah, Bandara 008, MIP Bandara. Nara, yes, sir. Can you tell me what is the purpose of uh, string commission unit in a manual gearbox? Uh, string uh, gearbox is uh, the very smoothly uh, gear shifting more than uh, manual gearbox. Uh, other uh, other gearbox, uh, I like that, sir. I actually didn't hear you. Can you speak louder? Big cloud. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, can you speak a little bit louder? I didn't actually hear you properly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. No, no, you tell the same thing again. Okay, uh, the synchronous uh, gearbox, uh, no, manual gearbox. Uh, uh, Gear shifting is smooth uh, more than other gearbox. Yes, the gearbox is yes, yes. it's shifting is smooth. And the smoothing effect is actually comes or the shifting smoothness is actually comes from this particular uh, item, the string commission. Uh, so I'm asking, how does it do? It? So what's the, what 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 makes it to like? Smoothly transit to uh, trans make a smooth transition between the gears. By the synchronizer, yes. Okay, yes. Right, it's good. Thank you. So, yes, in the string commission unit, so this whole component is actually known as string commission unit, right? I'll change it to spotlight. Yeah. So, whole part is actually known as string commission, right? So what it does is, uh, so you have like a inverted cone here in the string commission unit and there's a brass cone which is connected to the gear wheel, right? which is connected to the gear wheel. And this gear wheel is actually uh, fixed to this output shaft, fixed to this output shaft uh, through a bearing. So there's a bearing in between, right? between this uh, wheel and this shaft, there's a bearing. So because of that bearing, even though this wheel, this gear wheel is actually meshed and the gear wheel, even though it's actually rotating, it won't actually transmit any power to the shaft. The transmission, the power, uh, the rotational power into the shaft is actually done through this particular component, which is actually known by single machine. So when we are actually changing the gears, right? When we were changing the gears, uh, the moving component is actually this string commission. So string commission is, is actually moving back and forth as shown in this particular image, right? So it's very well shown in the below image actually as well. So your selector folks actually goes around. Uh, there's like a small groove here. So this is where the selector fork is actually uh, holding the, um, uh, holding the, uh, string commission unit. So once you change the gear, what actually happens is it's moved either back or forth uh, for this particular application. We assume that we, we can understand that it has to be uh, moved backwards. So 
once it's actually when it is actually moving backwards so uh this section this inner section actually going to get meshed with section over here right so these dogs these small uh sort of like a locking rings are actually known as dogs so these will actually go into the similar pattern available in this information which you can actually see it over here right so this is the section so once it goes in there the gear and synchro machine it is actually meshed so the power from the gear will actually go into the synchro machine which will then transmit through this shaft because sorry through this shaft because uh, it's actually uh, this um, uh, synchro machine unit actually is uh, fixed to the shaft through these splines so these are actually known as splines so this sort of grooved pattern on a shaft is actually known as splines these are used to transmit power so when you are learning about the engineering uh, uh, there's a module for you uh, which is actually called as uh, automotive component designing they in there you will be actually learning how to find the optimal number of splines so based on the number of based on the material and based on the power you are transmitting you have actually have to change the design of the spline and uh, the number of splines right anyways so that's how actually transmit the power the purpose of this cone shape is actually to uh, slow down and slow down and smoothly mesh the gears together that's why this cone is there so uh, so this cone is actually made out of like a very hard material not like maybe hard material it's actually very hard material which is very but very common material it's actually a uh, alloyed brass so that's why it's actually called as brass cones so uh, even though gear wheels are not prone to wear very fast because they are always meshed and very well lubricated uh, this string mesh unit right string mesh unit uh, is actually getting into quite a bit of abuse right quite a bit of abuse so it's actually always working with the friction because of that this surface actually tend to wear faster right tend to wear faster so uh, when it's actually mentioned like each and every components has to be properly inspected what it actually meant is uh, uh, when you are inspecting these you have to make sure that uh, it's not worn out and it's not uh, it's not actually having like very uh, stretching scratch marks or wear marks so scratch marks or wear marks means that uh, it end up uh, it it's it it, end, it scratch mark or wear marks means the gear changing was not done properly so if you slam the gear if you did not press the clutch then uh, too much force is actually acting on these surfaces it could actually damage the uh this cone shape in uh addition to that there's another one particular thing that could actually happen that's the heat generation if the system is the lubrication or if it does not have enough fluid inside the gearbox these surfaces could actually end up having uh generating a lot of heat which could end up having uh the heat spots right or hot spots it change the color there's like a certain type of like rainbow sort of color change is there so because of, with that also you can actually identify the gear box is properly uh used or not i actually added some videos related to this rather than me explaining without any proper explanation i thought it's better to explain it with some uh videos so i actually added some of them in the uh near the end of this um so uh so uh, the first three section is actually uh, connect uh, associated with the gears right associated with the gears gear wheels single machine and the bearings so these are the components usually wear in addition to that one uh, section that most people do not care about is the uh, selector right so selector mechanism also have to be very well maintained uh, this can be actually very very easily can be seen so this is how the select mechanism is actually working so there's like a forks so i i i know you guys already saw these things so there's like a forks and these forks are actually uh, locked right they they have like a 
small bold locking mechanism where it allowed to move a certain angle, certain distance back and forth. So uh, while this is actually happening, in order to select them, uh, you have something like this. Uh, wait. So over here. So now this uh, the selector rods. In order to select the selector rod, you have the gear shifter similar to this. This is exactly like the gearbox we actually had in the university, uh, which you actually have seen. So. So, um, uh, so you can see there's like a ball here and there's a, a ball here. So these two balls actually allow it to move freely, but uh, these are actually mostly made of uh, hard plastic, hard plastics, and they tend to wear with the time. So once it tend, once it worn out, it's it's become very hard to actually select the gears properly. So. Uh, if you actually see like a gear lever is very freely moving, the main, main course could be actually these uh, plastic bushes available here and here. So make sure that uh, they are properly uh, replaced. And uh, uh, one thing is this section over here, especially since lubrication, the gears box lubrication is not actually coming up to here. This section needs to be uh, lubricated once in a while so it needs to be greased once in a while so when uh, uh, if there's any maintenance is doing this section you make sure to actually put some grease over here in order to avoid the bearing out so uh, yeah so inspecting of the uh, i'm not actually going to go through like very detailed here without a proper or anything to show for you guys so what i found is some links actually there are some very good videos uh, which i found uh, there are some videos from uh, one professor who is actually teaching automobile automotive uh, technology also so i uh, attached these videos for you guys to actually go through them and uh, get more uh, information about this and i don't actually intend on talking about the manual gearbox so much of time because as you already have done the practical related to this the one uh, there's a photo here, right? Uh, it seems like a very simple, it seems like a, it's normal gearbox, right? But uh, it's not actually, this is not a manual or normal gearbox. If you uh, can see well, right? If you can see it properly, uh, can you see the selector forks are here? And uh, in addition to selector forks, there's another shaft actually going on top of that, right? On top of that. So this is not your typical gearbox. This is not your typical gearbox. From outside, it seems like a normal typical gearbox. But these sort of gearboxes are known as sequential gearboxes. These type of gearboxes are actually known as sequential gearboxes. So sequential gearbox means uh, in a normal gearbox, uh, what we do is we actually change the gear uh, from first to second, second to third, and fourth to like that. But at the same time, we can actually go from first to fourth and fourth to second, second to fifth, likewise also we can go. And you can actually change the gear in a normal manual gearbox. The reason for that is the gear lever is actually going in an edge pattern, right? We are actually moving it in a edge pattern. So we start from here, second, then we go to the third, fourth, come back, fifth. So if you look at it carefully, it's actually like a two edge once you add the Previous here, so this is a usual pattern. So because of this changing, uh, because of this, uh, we actually call it as an edge pattern gearbox. Uh, there's another type of gearbox gear changing mechanism, which is known as sequential gearboxes. It's the type of gearbox available in the motorcycle. So if you can remember, if you uh, try to remember it well, uh, the, in the motorcycle you can't actually select. Uh, you can uh, you can't actually change directly from one to third you have to go through second right you always have to go from one two three four if there's five five then again from five to one again you have to come for uh, five four three two one so you always have to go sequential right you always have to follow the sequence so that type of gearbox is actually known as a sequential gearbox right 
that type of gearbox is actually now known as a sequential gearbox. So, so this is a, a automobile or a normal vehicles variants or four wheel vehicle variants of a sequential gearbox. There are advantages of sequential gearboxes. Before we go into that, the shaft over here, right? So this is the select shaft in this sequential gearbox. If you can see properly what we do here is, we actually have a lever, we move it either uh, backward or front, right? So we actually move a lever back and forth, back and forth, right? That's all we can, we have to do in order to change the gear. So if you want to go from first to second, back, so second once and second to third, uh, pull the lever back again once. Likewise, we can go up to fifth. If you want to go back from uh, top to fourth, then we actually have to push the lever one time forward, right? One time forward, then the gears will automatically change. So these type of gears are not available in normal day-to-day uh, -day vehicle. One thing is these are expensive to make for a normal uh, vehicle because it's cheaper to make H pattern gearbox. As you can see over here, we actually have to add a another shaft like this and it actually have to have these sort of grooves which uh, actually move the selector fork actually over here right so when this uh, what we ended up doing is whenever we actually pull this lever right whenever we ended up pulling the lever this shaft actually rotate right this shaft rotate a certain amount of distance certain amount of angle so during that angle this uh, selector forks movement is actually grouped in these channels over here. So these channels will end up moving this uh, fork over here. So that's how it actually works, the basic idea of it. But the disadvantage is you have to have, uh, you have to actually add a little bit of more force into this in order to change the gears. As you can see, uh, we, uh, we don't have the leverage of the normal uh, H pattern gearbox, so we have to have well, we have to add more force into this. Uh, but there are some advantages of this gearbox. One thing is uh, this uh, sort of gearbox is very fast. Change the gears are very fast, as you can see over here. Uh, you actually have to change this distance from one to second. It takes a certain amount of time. Second will take takes even more time, right? But in a gearbox, a sequential gearbox like this, you just have to pull it lever a little bit. This is very much like a paddle shifter, right? Very much like a paddle shifter, but uh, quite a bit different because you have to have, you have a lot of force in order to move this. So, uh, so that's why I actually added this image for you guys to just see what's the sequential gearbox. You can actually see more this available in race cars usually. This is very much available in the race cars. In a normal passenger car, this is not exactly something uh, needed. Uh, this is not something needed. So most of race cars are not actually, you know, most of the manual or um, daily driven home use vehicles do not need. Okay. Uh, so we move into the automatic transmission. So I know you didn't actually learn automatic transmission yet. And there's a good reason for that. The reason being, uh, automatic transmission is quite a bit difficult to explain unless you know uh, how everything works related to that. So, but I'm going to actually try to explain how to uh, how it actually works. There's a uh, module uh, dedicated for the drivetrain uh, in your future. So during that module you will be learning this one about this automatic transmission with way more details the calculations how the mathematical part works hydro hydraulic part works and everything but i will give you like a brief uh, introduction into the into this section so yeah so what it actually does is uh, just to give a basic idea automatic gearbox what it uh, actually is a set of gears or set of a belt, either a set of a gears or a belt driven system. So there's 
them. Uh, so engine in the manual gearbox, which is uh, directly coupled through a clutch, right? In the automatic gearbox, uh, you actually have something called a torque converter. So torque converter is always attached to the gearbox. It's bolted to the gear. It's always attached to the engine. It's always attached to the engine. But, right, even though it's always attached to the engine, uh, it will not actually drive the vehicle all the time. It actually called as a fluid coupling. It's actually known as a fluid couple, right? The easiest way is to explain a uh, torque converter is uh, something like this. Assume you have fans, two fans, right? You have two fans. So one fan is actually connected to the power, right? And there's another fan. So this is actually rotating now. This is actually rotating from the electricity it's going. But the second fan is not connected to anything. And you take it, take that uh, fan and bring it in front of the fan number one, which is connected to the power. So when the fan number one is actually rotating, because of the wind flow, right? Because of the wind flow, right? Second fan started to move, right? Second fan started to move. But, right? Button, it won't move all the time. Right when the fan is rotating at a slower speed, when the number one fan is rotating at slower speed, the number two fan will not actually rotate. But once after it's reached a certain RPM, right? Once it reached a certain RPM, when the force, when the air force, that force of air coming from the uh, number one fan is enough to move the blades on the second fan, only the second fan is started to rotate. Right, so the same principle is actually used in the automatic transmission. So I'm actually trying to explain everything as simplest as possible. It's not uh, this simple though inside the token, but basic uh, working principle is like this. But at the same time, right, at the same time, so now the fan is actually rotating um, after it getting enough um, enough speed so if we try to load the second fan that means if we try to put a finger or something to stop it right what happened still this number one fan is rotating but the second fan will not keep will not actually rotate so this sort of coupling is actually known as a fluid coupling right it's actually known as fluid coupling very well used uh, technology or very much used method in the mechanical engineering so the same uh, principle is actually applied in the uh, automatic transmission. So in between the gearbox and the engine, you have something called a torque converter. The essential part of though, the what torque converter is actually doing is this particular job. It's actually uh, working as a fluid coupling, right? It's actually uh, working as a fluid coupling. Next to that, there are a set of components Let's discuss what those are. So now this image, uh, this image uh, is actually showing a very simplified, right? Very simplified uh, block diagram of a uh, automatic transmission. This is not the hundred percent accurate one. Right. I have made it simplest as much as possible for me to easily explain it to you guys. Okay. So again, this is not the most accurate version. So I'm just using something for uh, easily explain this. So that's the idea. Here. Okay. So again, you have the engine and engine is connected to the torque converter. This is actually acting or working as a uh, fluid coupling allowing the engine and the gear transmission system or gearbox to be actually be two sections. So if we use our previous theory, which we discussed earlier, uh, uh, last week we have transmission and we have gearbox. So this is the gearbox section, right? 
the whole section is comes on transmission but this is, is the gearbox section so this part is inside the gearbox housing torque converter is in the bell housing governor is actually most of the time available in the uh, available at uh, extension housing there's reason for that we will discuss later so basically uh, what actually happens is uh, engine rotate the torque converter and then rotate uh, it act as a fluid coupling between the gearbox and the engine so uh, when uh, torque converter is rotating it also rotates uh, something called a pump right so it's actually a hydraulic pump the first components in the automatic gearbox is the hydraulic pump so hydraulic pump right hydraulic pump drives two things hydraulic pump generate pressure right generate hydraulic pressure while it uh, generating hydraulic pump the pump also drive all the gear trains here. so there are set of gear wheels inside of this. but it's not your typical gear wheels it's actually have something called epicyclic gear wheels i think you have already learned no you are now learning what is a epicyclic gear train in your applied mechanics course right so in there you might have covered already i'm not exactly sure you are learning how what is a epicyclic gear train and how the calculation how the gear ratios are actually changing that particular type it's actually not your usual gear set it can actually uh, generate more than one type one set of gear train or one set uh, one gear ratio usually if you have uh, gears coupled together you have to actually change the wheels in order to come come up with a different ratio but in this without changing the gear ratio you can actually come up with different gear uh, without changing the wheels you can still come up with different gear ratios so a uh, pump actually uh, drive the gear trains and the hydro while it's rotating the hydraulic pressure pump actually uh, pressurize the oil it's actually a gear pump so inside it is is uh, like gear wheels two gear wheels actually sort of arrangement it's actually uh, pressurize the hydraulic uh, oil which goes to a hydraulic control valve system so this is what we usually called as valve bodies so here it's actually have sort of like set of act, uh, uh, channels and spring loaded valves valves spring loaded valves once uh, the pressure generated from the pump is over certain limit uh, one valve will open that valve will actually uh, provide the pressure from oil pump to a certain actuator which will actually change the gears wheels gear ratios right that's how the gear changing system works so pump actually yeah again pump actually provide the pressurized oil up to the hydraulic control valve set so once it come to the valve set it measure the pressure right it measure the pressure using a uh, coil spring so once it uh, once the pressure can overtake a, a certain uh, coil spring that valve will actually open so once the valve is open that uh, pressure will uh, move or will be actually channel to a actuator right that actuator then change the gears so i know this is a little bit odd for you guys to understand if you haven't seen a uh, automatic gearbox but bear with me because i will talk about each of these components separate so then uh, finally the final drive from the after changing the gear ratios the final drive is actually coming out when the final drive is coming out right there you have your governor right governor check whether the speed is correct if the speed is correct it let each to actually run if the uh, if governor felt like a engine vehicle is or the wheel speed is rotating at a higher rpm then it's close the valve and close the actuator and change the gears back to slow down the speed of the wheel so that's how this whole system is actually uh, uh works so it's already mentioned below so i guess you can understand well uh let us go through like each of these components so first one is torque converter right torque converter is the first part 
so as i told you it's the fluid coupling but it's not exactly similar to that two fan the example i took like two fans it's quite a bit different right quite a bit different so uh, how it works is uh, inside of this there's like components right so these are the components available inside the token so uh, torque converter the cover right outer cover is actually known as impel so this uh, the this whole system is actually sealed item so everything is fixed inside and welded so it, I, none of these components can be taken out right none of these components can be taken out so what happens is this uh, uh, this impeller housing is actually bolted to the engine flywheel or the flex plate in this case it's actually the flex plate when the flex plate is actually rotating the fluid flow right fluid the oil actually this is also filled with oil that oil uh, moves outward right moves outward uh, try to draw it move this way right and it comes outward and goes to these turbine wheels right once it goes to the turbine this turbine started to rotate so turbine is actually connected to uh, your stator so this so it goes through here comes this way right from these small holes right then it channels through the stator this is how it actually moves so when this is actually moving right when this is actually moving it's actually create a, a rotating assembly right rotating assembly similar to uh, what i actually explained so this is your number one flan this is your number two flan number two flan number one flan right and your gearbox which is behind this actually have a output shaft which is connected to your first gear train and uh, first gear train and your uh, oil pump right here you have a hydraulic oil pump right this oil pump sharp actually goes through and connected to here so when this is actually rotating this pump is also being driven pump is also being driven through this right through this only not through this through this one. okay so what happened is these things rotate and it actually drive and uh, this this there's like a connect there's like a fluid connection there's a fluid coupling though man there's no mechanical connection here so so because of that it ended up creating like a very solid bound right when the vehicle speed in start to increase right when the vehicles start to increase this speed become faster and this um, energy flow between these two right A rotational energy flow between these two becomes uh, almost similar so there's no slip between them then only the power will be actually transmitted to your outputs right then only the power will be actually transmitted to the outputs that means the output shaft so that's how basically this works but uh, to explain it a little bit in detail i actually found two videos i i highly suggest you guys to go ahead and go through these things because it's again i'm trying to teach you how to swim without a pool so uh read this and uh, oh, go through this and uh, try to understand little bit more about this so basically this is how it works right so now your torque converter is working it's actually coupled so this is the uh, another cut way of it so cut way of it uh, i don't know whether you can actually see it properly the fluid is actually going through so impeller is here and the fluid is coming up like this yeah so unfortunately it's not very clear here so this is your input shaft
this is your input shaft. So this is the input shaft into the gearbox. So it's actually connected through the impeller into the turbine. So this section is the turbine. As you can see, turbine is rotating the input shaft. Yeah, turbine is actually rotating the input shaft. So this is the uh, impeller and this is the turbine. I still don't know whether you can get it or not. So I highly suggest you to actually go through this again and again. So I actually typed the whole process again in order to understand it properly, but I'm not going to go through this again and again. The I What I explained is actually typed over here so you can read it and try to understand and please go through this link, uh, through that links again. So uh, this actually show how, uh, uh, how this uh, uh, fluid, fluid is actually coupling point is started. So as you can see here, you can see the input speed is increasing, right? And the efficiency of this process, right? Uh, this efficiency of this process started to drop. So there's a specific point, this coupling point is actually joined, uh, coming into there. So at that point, if you consider here, you can actually see the torque and ratio, the engine the torque and the output torque from all the impeller torque and the uh, torque and the output torque, the ratio between them one to one. So the same amount of torque actually generated by the engine will be actually supplied into the gearbox itself at this point, right? At this point. So there's like a vortex velocity uh, inside the gearbox, uh, inside the token order happening during this process. Uh, I didn't actually go through all of these uh, steps in order to explain to you because it's quite a bit difficult to explain it here. But um, that's the basic idea. That's how it actually works. I really hope you have to go through these things again. In the book, I actually suggest to you there are more details related to this. Again, there's a specific module for teaching this, there's a reason for that. So once this actually goes, uh, after this goes, uh, we'll go back here. So now we cover the torque converter. So torque converter, it goes to a pump. So this is just a general hydraulic pump, right? From hydraulic pump, uh, there's a shaft, right? There's a shaft. This line is actually shaft. This dark green line is actually a shaft, right? Dark green light is the shaft. Light green line is actually the light green arrow is actually hydraulic, right? This is the hydraulic line or the oil line. This is actually the oil line. You should have changed different colors. Yes, I also feel like now uh, I'll fix this in the one I'm actually updating you. So pump is actually driven while pump is driving. There's output shaft coming. That output shaft or input shaft, in this case, input shaft goes through the pump into the gear train. So the uh, turbine rotational power will actually directly subfeed it to the gear trains and the pump is also driven in the middle. So that pump is driven and it provides hydraulic pressure into the control vans and the actuator. So we'll go ahead and look into the gear trains. So inside the uh, um, automatic gearbox, we have gear trains uh, something called a cyclic or planetary gear train. So its arrangement is like this, right? This is the arrangement. So it could have more uh, shafts here, I mean, more wheels. So uh, the middle wheel, right? This one over here, this is actually called as the sun wheel, right? This is uh, called as the sun wheels. These smaller ones are known as planetary wheels, right? These smaller ones are known as planet. And the outer ring is known as ring gear. So this is the ring gear. This is the sun wheel. These are the planetary gears. And the, uh, this sort of um, bracket sort of uh, carrier, right? These are actually called as a carrier, right? This is actually called as a carrier. So this is known as the planet carrier. Right? So it actually connect all planet carry, uh, plan, carry planets into one shaft. So how it works is very simple, right? Very simple. So assume that power is actually transmitted. The power actually comes from the engine comes this way, 
right from this this way that means it actually comes to the sun wheel so when the sun wheel is actually rotating right when the sun wheel is rotating uh your uh these uh, uh sun wheel is rotate when the sun wheel is actually rotating what happened is uh, these planetary wheels also start to rotate which end up uh, rotating this uh, ring wheel right this is the ring gear so ring wheel started to rotate right so uh, what we can do is in order to get different gear ratios right in order to get different gear ratios uh, we can get a one gear ratio directly from the carrier here right sun um, planetary gear carrier so in order to get the planetary gear carrier to rotate so if we make this if we if, if we lock or if we hold this ring gear right if we hold this ring gear right here, you can see this huh? if we hold this ring gear over here if we try to hold this ring gear what happened is because of the sun gear is rotating it ended up uh, allowing the whole planetary gear carrier to rotate so that will give one gear ratio right it will give one gear ratio and if we stop the carrier right if we not allow the carrier to rotate but if we still provide power to the sun gear then what happens from sun gear to ring gear there's one ratio from ring gear to sorry from sun, sun gear to planetary gear one ratio from sun gear to the ring gear so from sun gear to the planetary gear one ratio from sun gear to the from planetary gear to ring gear another ratio so finally end up having a another gear ratio so with that you have two gear ratios you can actually take right you can actually take two gears and if you if we lock both so if we not allow if we allow this right if we allow this one uh if we keep the ring gear locked right if we keep the ring gear locked as well as the planets right if we uh, not allow these wheels to rotate separately then we will have one to one gear ratio also so we can take around four gear ratios out of this so instead of now assume that's one set so if you have two or three sets like that by chain by holding one come one wheel on the carrier or the ring gear you can actually get different gear ratios right different gear ratios that's what actually happening in the gear box itself so in the ring gear right in the ring gear as you have seen here there's a round band is going around this so there's something called a band right brake band these are called as brake band so brake bands are actually going around the ring gear so when the actuator if the actuator is activated for ring gear right that means ring gear will be locked so the hydraulic pressure will be actually hydraulic pressure will put this way into this section over here that will end up locking this whole ring gear uh, that will end up locking this whole ring gear allowing one gear ratio also right also which will be discussed separately in order to lock this uh, planet carrier what we do is we add clutch we actually have a small clutch mechanism in between so you have this planet carrier between the planet carrier and these ring gears so a planet carrier and these uh, planetary gears we add a small clutch mechanism so if the clutch mechanism is activated the ring gears could not uh, rotate separately so it has to rotate with the uh, carrier so if it is not activated it don't have to rotate with the carry okay so i'll 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 show that separately but i'm not exactly sure whether you get it uh so that's how the gear ratios the gear train is actually working hopefully you got it and again i add another video for you guys to go through so driving and holding devices as i told you earlier we use two things one is the brake band this is what actually goes around the 
ring here, which is simple to explain. The second one is actually to uh, using these called clutch packs, right? So clutch pack is actually holding the carrier, right? Planet carrier is actually held by the clutch packs. So unfortunately, it's not easy to explain this, but uh, once you go through the whole class, I'm sure you will understand. So what is the difference between this one? This is actually very similar. This clutch pack is very much similar to the one you actually see in the motorbikes. Uh, uh, small ring clutch, very small rings sort of a clutch pack is used to actually hold the carrier, right? So hold the carrier and for different reasons also. Uh, different other gear ratios are also taken by this. So one might actually ask how to get the reverse gear ratio in order to get the reverse gear ratio, you actually have to use two cap packs, two uh, gear trains. Uh, if you connect two gear trains uh, serially, you can actually get reverse gear ratio from this. So, uh, please, uh, you, you will see this in the video. Make sure you see this video. Uh, uh, the videos I actually attach here compared to the everything else we learn. This section is very hard to explain without if you don't see the videos so hydraulic actuators part right now we comes to the hydraulic control actually right so again we comes here the token under the wall uh, comes up pump and the pressure is actually delivered into this actuator set right actuator or the valve set. This is the valve set. So this valve set, the actual valves are actually looks like this, somewhat look like this. This is actually called as a valve body, right? Valve body. So valve body, uh, what you have is like the, these lines are where the hydraulic oil is actually flowing through. It looks like a mess. Uh, oil is not always traveling through these things when these uh, particular valves. So, two, three change valve. So this is the second to third gear changing valve, right? One to two gear changing valve. So these, when these gear changing valves actuate, only these will actually fill, right? So once the uh, actuator is open or the valve is open, the fluid is actually directed to a actuator over here. So this servo is actually the actuator. So at that time, brake band is actually activated and it will lock the ring here and uh, similarly the clutch pack also actuated by this 3 2 so this is how it actually works in addition to that you have the manual or drive or neutral uh, selection once it's uh, selected to drive only this uh, uh, hydraulic will actually flow up to these uh, valves and close the clutch packs until then it won't actually work so finally the uh, speed is actually measured by the governor once if it is too much this will as you can see there's a return like the pressure and everything is measured and can actually uh, take over any time if the vehicle is go or rotate uh, if the vehicle is trying to go over the actual speed limit it's supposed to go so that's how the basically it actually works so in order to explain this i Added this uh, explanation page. You guys can go ahead and understand. So read this. I'm not actually that much. In, I'm not trying to explain this that hard because it's something you actually have to learn later. Because of you only have to dismantle and uh, assemble and just get the basic idea of it. You don't actually have to understand how each and every component design and work. So that's why I put this through where you can go ahead because if I start to explain this, I will take another three, four hours, but still you will having some trouble uh, grasping this, yeah, grasping this section. Anyway, so once you combine all of these components, right, the gear changing and everything, this is what you actually end up. So for each gear, how each gear is changed is actually shown here. Unfortunately, uh, it's not that clear. And it's not that clear. So that's one of the reasons for the video. So if you try to look at this 
as it is you will not understand a single thing i i recommend you go through the videos right you go through the videos and finally come back to this page again then you will understand there's a very important video i actually attached in the uh, last section of this uh, or the last uh, last slide which you definitely have to go through and uh, finish make sure to finish, uh, go through all the videos that's actually video series you all have to go through all videos you will have a very good idea how this automatic gearbox actually works because nowadays automatic gearbox are very complicated there's a lot of hydraulic uh, now it's actually hydroelectric gearbox we still i'm uh, explaining you hydro mechanical system but now hydroelectric system where electrical signals also been considered before changing the gear so it's very complicated nowadays uh, rather than explain this uh, there's a very simple video which i'll actually show you the world's first automatic gearbox complete disassembly and complete assembly part by part explaining how each one is actually working so if you first watch that video you will actually get a very good idea how this gearbox works once you go through that you will understand there's nothing in here it's very simple uh, system that operates so i highly recommend you to go through this so yeah so the gearboxes uh, automatic gearbox gear diag gearbox diagnosis is not an easy work the one shown here is actually a, in um, uh, we call it as a gearbox testing bench so this is a test bench used for automatic gearboxes uh, which we don't have in the university and uh, it does not make any sense for us to buy uh, something like this these are mostly used for research and manufacturing industry not so even for the maintenance industry so uh, so that's why we don't actually use it so few things that could actually happen in a manual or automatic gearbox is one uh, is rust uh, it could actually generate rust in the valves itself uh, it could uh, generate uh, rust in the valve body so this uh, those valves i told you those can actually start a rust and the gear changing could be very rough and uh, clutch packs so these clutch could uh, clutch and brake bands they could actually start slipping there's like a friction material in them similar to a normal clutch these are known as wet type clutch so there's something called friction plate so friction plate, friction plate could actually end up losing the friction material then it will start to slip actually so yeah so one thing you can actually do to uh, check whether the gearbox is working properly it's called as a slipping stall test uh, where we change the gear into a uh, we put the car into drive and press the brake and uh, accelerate right at that time uh, engine is supposed to actually have uh, around the 1800 rpm it should actually uh, uh, it should actually stall the engine engine should be actually turned off but if it is a high powerful engine very if it is very powerful engine something like five liter or something like that engine this will not actually happen for them uh, doing the stall test is not easy this is one simple exam test that we can do uh, unfortunately doing tests for uh, uh, there's not much of testing can be done for uh, from outside uh, without dismantling there's almost no test available for uh, automatic gearbox so this is only one test what you can do is you put the um, uh, vehicle into drive and um, brake and slowly accelerate right slowly accelerate if, if you try to accelerate fast then you won't get this uh, problem it will not actually um, uh, stall but if you slowly increase the speed uh, step by step then it will actually stall that stalling rpm of the engine should be around 1800 rpm and uh, one important thing you should not actually do this again and again because this will end up creating a lot of heat in the gearbox which is not ideal for 
automatic gearboxes. Anyway, so that's it actually. I really don't have anything else to discuss about the automatic gearbox unless we are in a class with the automatic gearbox with us. So because of that, now you have the assembly section of the automatic transmission. So what I did was I actually added two videos, which is, um, is assembling and assembling process of uh, uh, modern engine, right? And uh, the pre the bottom video is what I was actually talking to you about. So this is where the uh, so this is Professor John Kelly. He will actually he has uh, posted some videos where he explains each and every step of uh, disassembling and assembling of a uh, automotive gearbox, automotive transmission. Uh, but the importance of this video is it's five or six videos. But the uh, main thing you have to remember it's the world's first automatic gearbox. So everything is very simple, so very easy to understand the process. So rather than me explaining again, that you guys can go ahead and watch the video. I highly recommend you to watch the video and uh, we'll um, understand more about this gearbox and how it works we can go ahead and we have um two or three gearboxes available in the workshop one is already dismantled and it actually assembled and that's one with me which i have to take at the university uh so uh, so one highest gearbox and one um one highest gearbox and one of the Transit CS CK gearbox. So you have the transaxle and the uh, usual longitudinal gearbox available for this assembling and assembly purpose. Anyway, so that's it. With this, uh, we, we conclude the transmission section. We can't discuss beyond this point. It's not possible to discuss anything about the transmission without going and doing the practical, right? Which is your job. Uh, so next uh, session we will discuss about the transfer okay, and differential and axle and uh, one more thing uh, so this is your uh, fix or this with this we are finishing or we are closing the unit two right with this we are closing the unit two so I'm supposed to put the assignment I didn't actually still prepare the assignment so I'm actually thinking something like a small poster sort of thing so poster means you just draw or fix something and make sure you show it in an artistic way so that sort of thing what i'm actually uh, leaning towards so you guys make it and uh, upload it um, so once i actually post the assignment in the uh, lms i will send the email to madhushan so he will be actually sharing it with you guys Anyway, so that's it uh, for today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. If you have any questions, you can actually ask now. Anything? So what is governor? Oh, Yuri is still learning about the governor, right? Oh, yes. I forgot that. Okay. I will give you a small example. Not an example. I will teach you what is a governor. It's very simple to teach. Right. Uh, okay. So, tell me. This is a rope. And I'm going to put a, like a stone. Rock or something in one end. And I'm going to hold it from this end. <coughs> I, so when I'm rotating, if I started to rotate this, right? Faster, the faster I'm go going to rotate, the force, the centrifugal force, right? There will be a force actually generated from this. This force will actually act outward this way, right? So this force is actually used to uh, control stuff, 
so this came like a long time ago uh, when the first uh, there's something some uh, there's some um, uh, subject or known as control system the world's first control system was actually developed by james watt he actually invented the governor the purpose of the governor is governing something something like a governing body right so governing body means which controls everything related to that similar to that governor what it actually does is it control so in the automatic gearbox uh, assume that for third gear right for third gear the maximum uh, output shaft speed is 3000 rpms right so that's the maximum speed so assume that somehow for some reason rpm goes beyond that for third gear right then what the governor does is it stepped in right it stepped in and uh, cut down the speed it cut down the speed by closing the hydraulic pressure going to the gears and changing the gears back to a uh, normal gear so then uh, let's say that now is in third gear so it cut down the third gear so uh, it shut down the third gear then the gear automatically can't go the engine goes to sorry gearbox can goes to second gear so the vehicle speed will automatically slow down okay so that is how the that's what actually gear governor does it actually governs it governs it check if whether everything is okay if it is going a certain value or a certain uh, parameter if a certain parameter is going a uh, over certain, uh, some value then it will uh, control it back to it will bring it back to normal uh, or the normal value so that's what actually governing does i am a little bit surprised now so you did learn foundation in automobile technology last semester right Okay, I actually have a question now. Um, yes, so that's what the governor does. Can somebody tell me how does a um, uh, diesel engine control its speed? So, diesel engines come with the inherent problem with them. The problem is if you uh, let's say you press your accelerator pedal halfway right then you ex uh, expect the engines uh, engine's highest rpm is 6000 not it will not go to 6000 let's say 3000 so you press the accelerator halfway that means engine should go up to around 1500 and stay there in a diesel engine it's never going to work like that so in the diesel engine they have an inherent problem because of their high energy density and high torque because of the i talk it's generating all the time uh if you do not actually govern it it will start to increase the vehicle's speed right so diesel engines actually have a governor and i know you learned about foundation in automobile technology last semester you didn't learn about this governor i'm not going to blame i just need to know whether you learned or not otherwise i have to explain someone just explain with it. did you learn the governor part abhishan so we learned about it you did learn right okay then uh, it's okay so anyway that's how the governor works so the reason for me to show this uh, stick go this uh, rock so what do you call this stone uh, sort of arrangement is to uh, show you how a governor works basically governor how it works is if you have something like a shaft that rotating shaft is there around that shaft you have uh, two weights one weight this side one weight in the uh, other side right then you hinge something like this uh 
and you add a sleeve here. So this blue color one can actually move back and forth. So sorry, up and down while this is rotating. So when this uh, green color shaft start to rotate, uh, these weights, right? We have two weights here, start to generate force these two directions, which end up pulling. When it is actually pulling, this sleeve should actually move downwards, should move down, something like this. Shaft will move down. If we actually connect this shaft uh, sleeve, if we connect this sleeve into like a fuel supply or something, right? When this is uh, gone through up to a, a certain RPM, this sleeve will actually end up causing a fuel supply. Then the fuel will be actually shut off. So in a diesel engine, you actually have the typical way. That, that's the way in the diesel engine, it's actually controlled the uh, RPM. So anyway, uh, that's how it actually works. So I hope you got your answer. Um, anyway, that's it then. So we'll meet in the next class. Thank you.